She hates me. She's disappointed. I could see it in her eyes when we met. I've got to stop sweating. Oh, she looked at my hairline. She thinks I'm bald. She's thinking I would never in a million years sleep with this guy. We think you're great. Oh, thanks. Wow, that's that's nice to hear. To begin, coffee would help me think. Coffee and a muffin. I'm going up to Santa Barbara this Saturday, and I I was wondering. Oh. I'm sorry. So I'll just be right back with your pie then. Drum roll, please. I'm going to be a screenwriter like you. I'm putting in a chase sequence. So the killer flees on horseback, cops after them on a motorcycle. And it's like a battle between motors and horses, like technology versus horse. Susan, we would really like to option this. You want to make it into a movie? I want to know what it feels like to care about something passionately. John LaRoche is a tall guy, sharply handsome. The book has no story. There's no story. Make one up. Okay, we open with LaRoche. No, we open at the beginning of time. Okay, we open with LaRoche. Crazy white man. We open on Charlie Kaufman. Fat, bald, ugly, paces. I've written myself into my screenplay. That's kind of weird, huh? I guess we thought that maybe Susan and LaRoche could fall in love. I just don't want to ruin it by making it a Hollywood thing. It's like I don't want to cram in sex or guns or car chases or characters overcoming obstacles to succeed in the end. She's crying. What's she hiding from? I think you actually need to speak to this woman to know her. People find love. People lose it. Every day, someone somewhere takes a conscious decision to destroy someone else. Who's going to play me? Oh, I think I should play me. Welcome to The Complete Works, an in-depth look into the career and filmography of Nicolas Cage. My name is Mike Smith, and joining me on this journey into the depths of true cagedom is my friend, co-host, and fellow cageaholic, Mike DiCrecio. How are you doing today, Mike? Good, good. I'm pretty interested to hear the uh, behind-the-scenes shenanigans for this movie, uh, so I'm excited for your preamble, I yeah. guess is what I'm saying. Excellent. Uh, well, we have now reached one of my favorite Nicolas Cage movies, and uh, one that I was uh, pretty excited to finally get to, because it had been a few years since I last saw it. You know, when we uh, started this podcast, mm-hmm. I was already in the mood to start watching, like, to watch Adaptation, because it had been a few years by that point. Uh, right. And I was like, oh, cool, I'll get to watch Adaptation soon. And now it's two years mm-hmm. later. <laughs> and I hadn't watched Adaptation, because I was like, I'm going to be watching it for the podcast eventually. I'm going to be doing it. Gotta save it. <laughs> Gotta save it. So I finally got to watch Adaptation again. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I want to be able to give some background about the production of this movie. Uh, but if you've seen the movie, then you already know <laughs> <laughs> about the production of this movie. Because the actual making of this movie is built within the plot of the movie itself. And some listeners' heads are starting to hurt already. But we're talking about... <laughs> The 2002 movie, Adaptation, directed by Spike Jones and written by Charlie Kaufman. Now, Mike, you had never seen Adaptation before, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a movie that I had uh, heard a lot about, obviously. Uh, I feel like this, you know, is a pretty well-regarded movie. Um, yeah. But I just never got around to seeing it. Uh, so I was, I'm glad that I did, finally. This, it was exciting to be able to watch it for the first time for the, for the listeners, Mike. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, have you seen other uh, stuff by Spike Jones and Charlie Kaufman? I think so. I don't think I am aware off the top of my head, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. Well, Spike Jones, uh, this was his second movie. He directed being John Malkovich. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, have, I guess I should have put that together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and since, since this movie, he's also directed uh, Where the Wild Things Are and Her. Yes. Uh, okay. And Charlie Kaufman also wrote being John Malkovich, and he wrote uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Uh, and then he wrote and directed Snetsky, New York, and Anomalisa. Okay, I have not seen Synecdoche, New York, or Anomalisa, but I have seen, or, and I haven't seen her, but I've seen all the other ones. Okay, so you've seen a little less than half. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Crushed it. <laughs> Great job. Uh, anyway, so this movie uh, is an adaptation of Susan Orlean's short nonfiction book, The Orchid Thief, but it is so much more... <laughs> <laughs> than, than just that. So that is the I, that would be the IMDb plot synopsis for this movie. <laughs> you'll be satisfied when we reach the IMDb yes. plot synopsis. <laughs> 
Uh, Charlie Kaufman and Spike Jones had previously worked together once before, having made Being John Malkovich. And uh, during the making of that movie, Charlie Kaufman was approached by the studio to write a screenplay based on The Orchid Thief, and he agreed. But he found himself at a crossroads, Mike, unable to make something that would make an interesting movie out of what was a fairly short book with very little plot. And then, as a Hail Mary pass, since he was fast approaching the studio's deadline, he started writing about the only thing he knew at the time. He started writing about how hard it is to write a screenplay based on The Orchid Thief. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. He, he inserted himself as a character in the script and started writing a movie about him writing the same movie. <laughs> uh, and that's what adaptation is. <laughs> there we go. There it, is. it all makes sense. Uh, sort of. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie <laughs> Kaufman actually explained his thought process a little bit by saying, uh, the idea of how to write the film didn't come to me until quite late. Uh, it was the only idea I had. I liked it. And I knew there was no way it would be approved if I was the one that pitched it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just wrote it and never told the people I was writing it for. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I only told Spike Jones as we were making Being John Malkovich, and he saw how frustrated I was. Had he said I was crazy, I don't know what I would have done. Charlie Kaufman thought his career was going to be over because of this movie, uh, <laughs> because of this script that he, was, that he turned into the studio. Uh, it's kind of a miracle that this movie exists. You know, there's. Uh, it seems like it. It seems like something that someone would have said no to at some point. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> somebody would have shut this down. Susan Orlean, uh, the author of the book, was dumbfounded when they approached her with the idea, uh, and only gave them permission when everyone else had agreed to it. Uh, <laughs> and today, she kind of looks back on the movie with admiration and says that the movie uh, is actually incredibly true to the book's themes of uh, life and obsession. So even if it isn't quite what anyone actually expected an adaptation of *The Orchid Thief* to be, it's still a pretty good adaptation of the book, all things considered. There you go. Yeah. Uh, plus, the movie is also a, a pretty brilliant Hollywood satire, uh, and it's about the uh, the constant battle between intellectualism and populism. That's a big part of the movie here. Uh, Charlie Kaufman, both the actual guy and the character, are the kind of tortured geniuses that create like unique, vibrant stories, but find it very difficult to reach an audience. And in the movie, Charlie Kaufman has a brother, Donald Kaufman, who makes shallow, derivative entertainment in Charlie's eyes, but people love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best script we've read all year. Uh, and the movie uses that push and pull between like high and low art to inform its own structure as it sees fit to the point where after Charlie takes uh, Robert McKee's screenwriting seminar, the movie suddenly becomes a much more conventional Hollywood crime tale. Uh, now, Donald Kaufman does not actually exist. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you're aware of that or not, Mike, but Donald Kaufman is not a real person. I assumed, but I, I didn't bother to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> that said, the movie is credited if this, in the credits of adaptation. It says written by Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman. Does it really? It does. <laughs> uh, and Donald Kaufman is a made-up representation of uh, everything Charlie Kaufman both can't stand and also kind of wants to be. Uh, it's his fractured personality, Mike. Exactly. And Nicolas Cage is the lead of this movie playing both of those characters, Charlie and Donald Kaufman. And I truly think that this might be his best performance. I am a big fan of Nicolas Cage in this movie. Uh, but outside of Nicolas Cage, the rest of this cast is pretty fantastic, many of whom only pop up for like a scene or two. Uh, Meryl Streep plays the author of The Orchid Thief, Susan Orlean, while Chris Cooper plays uh, John LaRoche, the subject of The Orchid Thief. Uh, now, Cage was nominated for his second Oscar for this movie. Uh, although he lost to Adrian Brody for The Pianist. Uh, and Streep and Cooper were also both nominated for Oscars for this movie. Uh, and Chris Cooper actually won won his Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for Adaptation. Look at him go. Yeah, beating out uh, Ed Harris for The Hours, Paul Newman for Road to Perdition, John C. Riley for Chicago, and Christopher Walken for Catch Me If You Can. That, that's a pretty stacked uh, field for him to win against, too. It is, yeah. And it's not something that, like, I, he's very good in the movie. It's not, I, like, when I'm watching the movie, I feel like I'm so transfixed by what Cage is doing. Uh, it's, it almost like overshadows the other actors. So I'm surprised that Cooper uh, ended up winning his category, but uh, it's still pretty cool. Uh, and then the other cast, there's so many people in this movie, Mike. I have a huge <laughs> list of things to go through here. Uh, Kara Seymour, who uh, recently was part of the main cast of the Steven Soderbergh TV series The Nick, uh, plays Amelia Kavan, mm -hmm. the girl Charlie Kaufman is in love with, but due to his social insecurities, uh, is unable to tell her. Uh, the great character actor Brian Cox, uh, from films like Manhunter and X-Men 2, uh, appears briefly as Robert McKee, a, a real-life screenwriting instructor. Uh, who really does teach that seminar that Charlie Kaufman attends. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And uh, Robert McKee, hit, uh, the real guy, Robert McKee himself, 
actually recommended Brian Cox for the part for the part in this movie. <laughs> really? That's <Yeah>. perfect. <laughs> uh, Tilda Swinton is in this movie, uh, known for many things, mostly being awesome in general. Uh, and she plays a uh, Valerie Thomas who hires Charlie to adapt the book. Ron Livingston, best known as the lead character in Office Space, plays a uh, Charlie's agent Marty Bowen. Maggie Gyllenhaal plays a uh, Donald's girlfriend Caroline Cunningham, and the amazing Judy Greer from uh, Arrested Development and Archer appears very briefly as Alice, a waitress who Charlie tries to ask out. Uh, and in even smaller roles than that, uh, Jim Beaver from Deadwood and Justified appears as Ranger Tony. And uh, several cast and crew from Being John Malkovich make cameo appearances in this movie as well, as some of the movie takes place on the set of that film. Uh, the cinematographer Lance Accord and director Spike Jones appear, and they also shot and directed this movie. So, you know, they just put the camera on them for a second. Uh, and uh, John Cusack, John Malkovich, and Catherine Keeter all show up as well. And, of course, all three of those actors have appeared uh, in Nicolas Cage movies before, Mike. Catherine Keener Ooh. was in 8mm. And uh, lest we forget, John Cusack and John Malkovich were both in uh, Con Air. All three lead actors in Con Air in this movie. Yeah, I, I am tempted to call this We Made It Ma 2 uh, for <laughs> <laughs> adaptation. Yeah, I mean, it's not like, <laughs> it's not quite that. <laughs> Cusack and Malkovich are only in like a scene each. I don't think Cusack even has any lines. I, I don't think uh, he does either. Uh, plus, Roger Willie, who was the awesome and badass Charlie Whitehorse in the last movie we talked about, Wind Talkers, uh, also appears here as a character named Randy. Uh, and even more tiny cameos abound. In a flashback sequence, Doug Jones portrays British explorer August Marguerite, uh, Augustus <laughs> Marguerite. Uh, and uh, Jones is best known for his work with Guillermo del Toro. He plays uh, Abe Sapien in the Hellboy movies. He's a big like um, prosthetics guy. He's in a lot of different yep. things. He was, he was the bye-bye man. If anybody saw that movie, <laughs> <laughs> he was the Bye Bye Man. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, plus, uh, director Curtis Hansen, who uh, made movies like L.A. Confidential and Eight Mile, who actually just died recently, uh, plays Susan Orlean's husband. And uh, David O. Russell appears in this movie, uh, the director of The Fighter and Silk Lines Playbook. He plays a New Yorker journalist uh, who's just hanging out at the party at uh, Susan Orlean's house. Uh, and Stephen Tobolowsky's name appears in the credits of the movie, but his scenes were cut. He, they are, those are deleted scenes. Ah, which is unfortunate. Uh, now, like I said before, adaptation was directed by Spike Jones, and it was his second feature after being John Malkovich. He's gone on to make Where the Wild Things Are and Her with Walking Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson. Screenwriter Charlie Kaufman has gained a reputation as one of the most esoteric and unique voices working in movies today, and the result is that his stuff uh, isn't particularly commercial, and it's difficult to get his projects off the ground. <laughs> he is, you, could, you could say, yeah, he is, <laughs> he's not worked a ton since adaptation, which is a shame. But since that movie, uh, he's only written three movies and directed two. Uh, Michelle Gondry's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was his, and then uh, there was a four-year gap between that and Snetsky, New York, and then there's like a seven-year gap between that and uh, Anomalisa, his most recent movie, which is in 2015, uh, and that movie was incredible. I love that movie. Uh, and the credits for this movie list the screenplay as being written by Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman, and it went on to be nominated for the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, and this means that Donald Kaufman has the distinction of being the only fictional character to be nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That is a that's real amazing. <laughs> Holy crap! Yes, that is a uh, that is pretty insane. And the uh, IMD plot synopsis for adaptation reads: A lovelorn screenwriter becomes desperate as he tries and fails to adapt The Orchid Thief by Susan Orlean for the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that was better than I thought it was going to be. But <laughs> still, but still not so hot. Yeah. So, uh, Mike, what were your overall thoughts on adaptation? So. My overall thoughts on adaptation were mostly, wow, and this is crazy. Uh, it, it <laughs> I guess it's one of those things where you, you write what you know, right? And uh, the thing that Charlie Kaufman knew apparently was that he couldn't write this movie, so he just <laughs> wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm tempted to make a, a, a comparison to uh, Barton Fink, which I, I haven't seen, but I oh. know what it's a... I, well... <laughs> Oh, this God. is where I was. I, yeah, this is what I'm tempted to because I know it's about a, uh, a screenwriter with or a writer with writer's block. So they wrote a movie about that. <laughs> the Coen Brothers wrote that. Yes. Uh, uh, so in its most basic form, that's. <laughs> yes, I'd, I'd agree with that. Like, and it's in its basic form, like they are about basically the same thing. Uh, yeah. And yeah, you should absolutely fucking watch Barton Fink. I don't know. I know. It's, <laughs> it's on my, my list of shame for movies my, I haven't seen. It's one of my very favorite movies. I think it's Coen Rose best. Uh, but yeah, you should watch Barton Fink. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, they are very similar movies in that regard. But I think adaptation takes it a step further. Um, okay. Because adaptation is about, like, the, like, you know, the Coens had writer's block and so they wrote Barton Fink, which is a movie about 
or writer having writer's block. Charlie Kaufman had writer's block uh, and wrote Adaptation, which is a movie about Charlie Kaufman having writer's block. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> writing the movie that you're watching right now. Is... Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, he, he, uh, he decides to skewer Hollywood uh, and yet make – by the cast alone, one of the most Hollywood movies of all time, <laughs> <laughs> including yeah. writers and directors and producers and, and just everybody right. in this movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I'm a big fan of adaptation. This is my second time I've seen it, and uh, I'm a big fan of everyone involved too. Uh, you know, this this to me feels like such a like bold and momentous idea, and it kind of feels like the only thing like something you can only really ever capture once. Like once yeah. in your career, you can do something that's insane as this and charlie kaufman has managed to do that several times but i feel like <laughs> i feel like specifically like for this specific idea like taking somebody else's work uh and reworking it into something that is about you is, right <laughs> is insane it shouldn't have worked and it's like they even comment about that in the movie like that's those, that's lines of dialogue in the movie about how this is a terrible idea and like what am i doing like what's going on here but like they keep doing it anyway and it kind of becomes insane and profound and Nuts, and uh, I think Charlie Kaufman's work often sees characters uh, trying to latch onto something real, even though they never seem to know what that is. And right. I find that a very profound thing. And there's a constant search for meaning that adaptation strives toward. And there's like an analysis of the way we look at art and how it conveys the human experience. You know, there's the desire to feel passion when it feels like you're incapable of it. Uh, I feel like pretty much every Charlie Kaufman screenplay makes it seem like he's going through a lot of stuff on a personal level. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just trying to work it out on the page. Yeah, like. I think you could definitely say that for adaptation, uh, especially because yeah. he's the main character in the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it is. It's incredibly interesting that there is that scene when uh, Charlie Kaufman's talking with his agent, I believe, and he mentions, you know, uh, the agent just tells him, "Just make up a story, add a story to it." Yeah. And he's like, "No, I, I have, I have a an obligation to the original work and to the to the author of the book." Right. To, 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 you know, adapt it correctly. And then, then we get this movie. <laughs> it's, 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 one, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty insane. And I feel like it uh, like th this movie begins with uh, this stream of consciousness voiceover from Nicolas Cage uh, and the structure of the movie kind of follows suit from that voiceover. Uh, and I feel like that's a deliberate choice because it like kind of reflects the actual writing process, like the kind of like just throwing all the ideas at once, seeing what sticks, not being able to come up with anything, hating yourself. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it's part of it. And then there's a deliberate choice to tighten the structure of the movie as it goes along, uh, as Charlie's ideas become more fully formed. And at the same time, at about a th like two thirds of the way through the movie, he brings his brother, Donald Kaufman, uh, on board to help write the script. And that's when it starts becoming a more generic Hollywood product. Right. Uh, and by the end, before you even know it, it turns into this crime thriller uh, res <laughs> resulting uh, in, you know, there's like crazy violence out of nowhere and all this kind of stuff, like the stuff that Donald Kaufman would write and the stuff that you see in uh, so many like other Hollywood movies and stuff that Nicolas Cage has starred in. Uh, yeah. It, it felt like, you know, this crazy sprawling epic that ends uh, by being eight millimeter, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, it definitely, I definitely was feeling uh, comparisons to Deadfall. Just in, uh, I guess you know when we talk about Cage's performance, not it, I have a reason for picking Deadfall, okay. but <laughs> um, but it definitely feels like that, right? Like uh, it turns into this weird. We, we you know you shouldn't blend genres, but then we get this. We dive headlong into this genre film at the end, you yeah. know, that Kaufman explicitly tells us earlier that he doesn't write. Yes. Right when he when uh, Donald Kaufman's like, oh my genre's uh, thrillers. What's yours? And he already <laughs> asks about uh, violence and you know, violent ways to kill characters, and he says, I don't write that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, <laughs> and then the last you know act of this movie is just taut crime thriller. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, I, I I do want to talk about all that very soon. And the movie is uh is soul crushing in in parts. Oh, yeah. There there's some really like uh, hard to watch scenes, but it's also hilarious uh at other points it is a really funny movie and i feel like there's never been a more accurate depiction of the writing process than in this movie i feel like i'm watching it and i'm seeing myself at my screen trying to write something <laughs> where he's like looking at a blank page and just staring at it for a really long time and just thinking like i'm hungry like i <laughs> i need to reward myself by get i need to either go out and get coffee now or i'll write a paragraph and then i will go out and reward myself <laughs> Yep. 
<laughs> I'll just uh, sit, I'll just establish the themes and then I'll get caught. I'll get a muffin. Exactly. And then he writes one paragraph and he's like, I need a muffin. Yeah. <laughs> this is like constant back and forth that Charlie has with himself about like between like, this is brilliant and I suck. And, uh, you know, it's, I think it's something that every writer has gone through at some point. <laughs> Um, yeah. But it's like amplified to such a degree because you're dealing with all of the uh, weirdness and insecurities that Charlie Kaufman uh, puts upon himself in this character. Uh, now, when Nicolas Cage plays both Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman in this movie, Mike, what did you think of Nicolas Cage's performance? Performances? Performance yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think that's the one. <laughs> um, I so I picked Deadfall as the comparison. I mean, clearly the other comparison is uh, Leaving Las Vegas. I think. Uh, okay. Not only because they're both Oscar nominated, right? Um, sure. Uh, Leaving Las Vegas is the comparison to make for the successful comparison of adaptation, right? They are both manic, they are uh, neurotic, crazy characters, and we are getting that in adaptation also. But Deadfall is the, I feel like the the attempt at that in a much obviously sillier uh, type of genre, right? And yeah. what that movie is. Uh, you know, it's a it's what the, it's what the last act of this movie is. Uh, <laughs> so we were given unhinged, crazy, manic cage in Deadfall, but uh, in a, an adaptation, he plays. I, I mean, I don't know Charlie Kaufman personally. Maybe he is. I mean, you know, having seen some of his movies and this movie, I assume yeah. he is neurotic and insecure <laughs> and, and all of those things. And and I feel like you know the the era of Cage that this hap this that adaptation happens in it's. Kind of what I talked about in, in Wind Talkers a little bit, what I was saying, where I feel like there's glimpses of Cage's later career, you know, what he is now, contemporary, where he's crazy unhinged and nothing comes from – the mania of the characters doesn't come from anywhere. But okay. in adaptation, it is rooted in that character. We are somehow given enough – of his backstory, right? Or he's a rounded enough character that his mania and insecurity and craziness works very well for what the story, the themes of the story are trying to convey. Right. Yeah. I think, I think uh, part of what I really love about this performance, I think this is probably Cage's best performance. Uh, and I think part of the reason for that is because he embodies both characters so well. There's a very, it's very rarely, um, I've said this before in the podcast where I'm watching a Nicolas Cage movie and I think to myself, I forgot that was Nicolas Cage for a minute, you know? Right. Like he's, yes. so, he's so engrossed in the character. And it happens a couple of times. I think Raising Arizona is a big one where he kind of falls into the character. And uh, Kiss of Death was also one where I feel like he uh, really fell into the role. Uh, and, mo- and that's not a slam in Nicolas Cage. He has a persona. <laughs> he has a persona. And a lot of actors have a persona. And he plays right. into that persona a lot. Uh, but this this felt like, you know, he's playing against type almost. Like something that I hadn't really seen him play before. Uh, and he has the task of playing both Charlie and Don Kaufman in this movie and making them distinct from each other. And uh, I think he does a great job. You know, many of the best scenes in this movie are the ones in which Cage is acting against himself, uh, which yeah. the movie accomplishes uh, using split screen technology. That's uh, pretty seamless when they're on screen together, I think. Uh, you know, it's very, it's very difficult. Like, obviously, like, you know that Nicolas Cage can't be in two places at once when you're seeing him on screen at, at two different places. But yeah. it looks like he's, you know, they're matching their eye lines and everything like it, like, spatially makes sense. Uh, and also, I should point out, Nicolas Cage's brother, Mark Coppola, who uh, also appeared in The Cotton Club, Vampire's Kiss, Deadfall, and Leaving Las Vegas, was uh, Nicolas Cage's stand-in on set. So he would, like, pop in and, like, really? be Cage's, uh, like, Cage number two uh, right. in, in whatever scene he needed to be in. Uh, now, Nicolas Cage actually wore a fat suit for this movie, too. Uh, and he plays Charlie as uh, the kind of guy who's too smart to bother putting work into his physical appearance. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> yes. Yep. Like he's, al- he's always dressed down. He's nervous. He's sweaty. He's balding. And then uh, Donald doesn't even look that much different than, uh, than Charlie does. I think, uh, I think he loses the fat suit for Donald. Uh, okay. And the hair isn't as as balding, um, but Cage carries that character with so much more confidence than he ha- does with Charlie. Uh, whether it's just talking to girls or whether it's like developing ideas for a screenplay, like he doesn't seem to have any like the kind of self awareness that Charlie does that is like destroying him on the inside. <laughs> right. He he seems to uh, Donald as a character seems to uh, almost like not be smart enough to realize that he's not smart. Right. Like, whereas, <laughs> I mean, just just compared comparing to like uh, Charlie as a character, when when Donald is pitching the uh, starts, the idea about, uh, you know, his idea for the three, his movie that he's right, his script that he's writing, yeah. where the the cop and the, and the kidnapped girl are the same person. But like, how could they ever be both in a basement and also be in a police station? Yep. Uh, 
Uh, and that just ne- that thought never crosses his mind. It doesn't phase him that that doesn't make sense. And <laughs> Charlie, as a character, has to just resign to the fact that, like, yeah, sure, whatever. Like, yeah. And it, it's and, <laughs> I don't know. It's it, that's a, that's a great scene. I love that. That was hilarious. Yeah. Every, everything about the three is the best thing ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but yeah, like I was saying, like I was saying before, like Charlie, Charlie Kaufman kind of represents like the intellectualism, like the high art, uh, and uh, Donald Kaufman kind of represents like you know populism, like what's considered low art. Uh, right. And there's like this kind of uh, contrast between the two, and like it's it's almost like one can't exist without the other. Uh, and you know Charlie Kaufman's work becomes better because he. Uh, you learn some of Donald Kaufman's techniques and Donald Kaufman looks up to Charlie so much. He will always like try to incorporate whatever Charlie's or whatever advice Charlie can give him and anything he can use. Uh, and one of the, one of the things I found interesting about this is that uh, Nicholas Cage has said that he ignored all of his own instincts as an actor uh, while playing this movie, uh, while playing Charlie and Donald uh, and just did it exactly as Spike Jones directed him to play it. Uh, interesting. And- this is his best work. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's his, and he got nominated for an Oscar for it too. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, which is uh, an interesting thing for sure. But also, I think it's partially because Spike Jones knows Charlie, like knew Charlie Kaufman pretty well because right. they had written Being John Malkovich, uh, and so I think he was more going by like I don't know, if Char- I don't know if Charlie Kaufman was on set for this. I don't, I, I doubt he was. I, I just feel, I just feel like that would be torturing yourself to just watch <laughs> right. Nicolas Cage portray you as this like. Uh, sort of narcissistic, neurotic, like uh, insane person almost. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I had wondered if Cage, you know, how or how much of Cage's performance was actually modeled on Charlie Kaufman, like the real human. Right. Um, but I guess you know, if following Spike Jones, like you said, Spike Jones, I assume knows him pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> having worked together, that they would able to, he would be able to direct Cage in, in that direction at least. Exactly. Uh, now, how do you think this role fits in with the roles that we've seen Nicolas Cage play so far, Mike? Uh, I think this is a pretty huge departure for Cage. Yeah. Well, it's it's definitely right. We, you know, we t- we talked about it a lot when we were doing the We Made It My trilogy. That uh, at the <laughs> in his acceptance speech, his Oscar acceptance speech for leaving Las Vegas, he praises Hollywood's uh, you know ability to to raise up and acknowledge small, crazy artistic stories and then he goes off yeah. to make these big the biggest blockbuster movies of all time <laughs> yeah. or that style of movie at least yeah uh and then we get like leading hunk cage for a sure. while and then we get this movie that yeah. <laughs> like, is back to his, you know his departure for the last 10 years or whatever it's been since leaving las vegas came yeah. out i mean one, one thing you can say about nickel cage career is that you can't really ever pin it down yeah uh, as... <laughs> correct <laughs> yeah. Because no matter what, like every movie that we're doing, like he's just jumping from genre to genre, place to place. Like he's playing so many different kinds of characters, often yeah. doing them kind of in a similar way. But like he's uh, used doing it in a whole variety of different things. Like there's you know a whole list of Cage War movies uh, that didn't even have war in them. That was just him like <laughs> yeah you know, being like war adjacent movies. And then he had Wind Talkers and uh, you know there's like like Wind Talkers and Captain Corelli's Mandolin on the surface are two similar movies. They're both uh, World War II, right? Right. Uh, he plays a soldier in both of them, but at the same... One's a romance, where Nicholas Cage plays an Italian soldier, uh, and one's... An Amer- he's an American soldier, and it's like a war combat action movie that's directed by John Woo. You know, <laughs> so it's like... They're, yeah. Like, they, they're, yeah. they're only released a year apart, but they are two incredibly different movies. Uh, right. And so, you know, Cage... I think Cage has an eye for just trying to do as many different things as possible. Uh, and adaptation, I think, is the differentest of, uh, of them all. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we haven't really seen cage play a character quite as pathetically as he plays Charlie here. I don't think. Yes, absolutely. I think even leaving Las Vegas, uh, that character is not as just kind of (laughs) hopeless. And I mean, leaving Las Vegas is not a very hopeful movie. I guess. Yeah. He, I think pathetic is the the best word for, uh, Charlie Kaufman in this movie. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think cage is like playing against type a bit here, uh, because you know, he has like his little like Eureka moments and he's like, uh, there's moments where he's like really into it and engaged, but like there isn't any like outsized over the top quality to his performance. I feel like, I feel like he's mostly going inward with this role and uh, with Donald as well. Uh, and so I think that's, uh, that's interesting, uh, to see from him. And, uh, you know, we have seen him play a screenwriter once before in leaving Las Vegas. Uh, so that's kind of a, kind of interesting coincidence too, that those are the, those are the two performances that got him Oscar nominations. Uh, and if there's anything the Oscars like, it's a movie about movies. (laughs) (laughs) This 
is very true. Now, yeah. uh, Mike, were there any moments or scenes in the adaptation that uh, stood out to you? I think, uh, well, that, I guess it's tied together, you know, to the last question in this one. Uh, I think the, the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes of this movie is interestingly, we get the glimpses of Cage as, as Nicolas Cage, quote unquote, like the actor, you know, the character that he's always, or the personality or persona, how did you phrase it earlier? Um, where, where you can always aware that it's Cage, right? right yeah. Um, when it becomes this kind of like rote genre thriller action, not action, but that, you know, that kind of thing. When they're in the swamp being met, hunted by, uh, by, by, by the author and uh, LaRoche, the, uh, Cooper's character. Yep. Um, where, you know, they're screaming at each other after they get attacked by the alligators. But and I think it's, you know, hilarious that he takes that screenwriting uh, seminar in the towards the middle of the movie yep. and like the biggest piece of advice he tells him that well there's two i guess for the love of god help you if you use voiceover uh <laughs> yes <laughs> which which interrupts the voiceover in the movie yes, from now you'll be standing around a posh cocktail party congratulating yourself on how you spent an entire weekend locked in a room with an asshole from hollywood for your art i am pathetic i am a loser so what is the substance of writing I have failed. I am panicked. First, I have sold out. I am worthless. Last, I, uh, what the fuck am I doing here? The what the fuck am I doing here? Fuck. It is my story. weakness, my your ultimate lack of conviction that brings me here. Easy answers. Lose to shortcut so yourself to success. Life. And here so I am, because my jaunt into the abyss brought me nothing. Well, isn't that just the risk desire. one takes for it's attempting it's something new? I should leave here right now. I'll start over. I need to face this project head on. And God help you if you use voiceover in your work, my friends. God help you. It's flaccid, sloppy writing. Any idiot can write voiceover narration to explain the thoughts of a character. Okay, that's it. One hour from now. <laughs> yeah, so throughout the whole movie, there had been voiceover for, you know, the first half or so. And then as yeah. soon as, as, soon as uh, Robert McKee says that in the screenwriting seminar, the voiceover in the movie just abruptly stops. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like mid-sentence. It's amazing. Yeah. But then the, the other biggest advice or the most emphatic advice that Brian McKee gives him is don't ever use a deus ex machina, right? Yes. Uh, and then an alligator shows up out of nowhere and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and eats LaRoche. And it's hilarious because yes. it's, it's, you know, like we have pointed out that he takes this uh, seminar in the middle of the movie and then the last act or so becomes – this kind of rote Hollywood style movie yes. that includes the Deus Ex Machina. <laughs> right. And that's completely intentional. And that's something that I find really interesting about this movie because a lot of people don't get that. <laughs> right. You know? uh, that's, I was like, you know, uh, gathering Netflix reviews for uh, this mm -hmm. movie. And uh, there are a lot of negative ones because people are like, you know, it's kind of interesting. And then it goes like completely off the rails in its third act. Like, <laughs> right. and stuff like that. And like, uh, like the people like, I think that is such a, a leap of faith for your audience to take to like to try to do something like that to try to uh, you know do this whole thing critiquing uh, you know generic Hollywood endings and then end with a generic Hollywood ending, um, right. but making that part of the critique is uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is uh, is really interesting and I think it's tough for some audiences to swallow, uh, yeah. But it is I think kind of brilliant uh, and there's so much stuff. I mean the uh, part of the uh, screenwriting thing there i think um the screenwriting thing also plays into that uh robert mckee meets up with uh, charlie for drinks and he tells him that the script can be flawed you know there could be like meanderings and stuff here and there as long as you wow an audience with the ending because that's what they care about uh right so at that point that's when the narrative started to converge and uh charlie brings donald on board as another screenwriter uh and they become embroiled in a stakeout of susan and laroche and that results in susan trying to kill them and ultimately donald's death donald dies at the end of this movie <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they become a, they uncover a drug ring, sort of. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> it's like a whole like like boilerplate crime thriller that gets like yeah. tacked on at the end. Uh, because and it's it's because Charlie goes to the screenwriting seminar because he brings Donald Kaufman on board uh, to help write the script because the movie is written by Charlie and Donald Kaufman. It's that's right. <laughs> the credits of this movie say written by Charlie and Donald Kaufman. So when the movie turns into this boilerplate crime thriller at the end, that's when Charlie brings Donald on board to help him write the script. And that's the type of script that Donald is writing throughout the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they even say that way earlier in the movie, right? When, um, when Donald first brings up the idea of going to a screenwriting thing and he's talking and, uh, Charlie says something about, you know, anything that has rules is just to get you to conform to it or something along those lines. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and then that, that's what the movie does. <laughs> I 
everything's a loop, Mike. Time exactly. is a flat circle. Exactly. Uh, and the, uh, we, I did want to talk about the, the three a little bit, Donald's script. Uh, yeah. Because it is what it is so funny. <laughs> Every, every time they talk about the three, I think it's hilarious because it sounds insane. Uh, yeah, just, it's hearing, not just hearing Donald talk about it, he's saying it's like this uh, serial killer mystery uh, where it turns out these multiple personalities. He talks about this very early on in the movie, uh, it's like the serial killer that has multiple personalities, and then there's a twist at the end where every single character is revealed to be the same person. <laughs> yeah, and they uh, eat each other to the death. <laughs> And Cage is telling him, right, like, Charlie is telling Donald right at the beginning, like, that's derivative and, you know, multiple personalities have been done to death. And uh, what's hilarious is that the uh, <laughs> the twist at the end of the three uh, was very similar to a twist in a movie that came out a year later called Identity. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then what's even crazier is that there was a movie a couple years later that was called Three, which starred uh, Mark Blucas, who played Riley in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, okay. And that movie got slammed for being the three like it's <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's amazing yeah uh and then even even like multiple personality serial killers are still uh, all the rage today M. Night Shyamalan just had a hit with uh with yeah he loved it <laughs> I did <laughs> it was pretty good uh but even even like outside of just that like story thing like there's like bits throughout like uh Donald's describing a chase scene that he added to the movie uh where it's a chase between a cop car and a guy on a horse uh, and he's talking, he's talking about the themes of that. And it's like, you know, it's technology versus horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the best. And then Charlie's like, so are they still, are they all still the same guy? And he's like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, uh, <laughs> Charlie, I think Charlie like reads the script or like reads a little bit of it at the beginning. And he's telling Donald that it's terrible. And Donald's like, mom called it psychologically taught. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's the best. It's just bizarre jargon. It's, it's like Hollywood jargon. It's right? so good. And then everyone loves it. Everyone loves the script that Donald wrote, except for Charlie. Uh, yeah. And that's kind of the, sort of the brilliance behind it. Like, uh, Charlie's agent uh, loves it, Ron Livingston's character. He's talking about how it's like the best script he's read all year. Uh, somebody compared it to like Silence of the Lambs meets Psycho. Uh, yeah. Catherine Keener is like have, you know, like playing Boggle with them at the house, and she wants to be in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also one of the funniest things in the movie when Charlie like yeah. Donald and uh, Catherine Keener's in the house and Charlie's like Catherine Keener is at our house. <laughs> yeah, we're playing Boggle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did love that. Like that, you know. The, then, the, then I guess we keep just coming back to it. How the, how the movie just embraces it eventually, like kind of gives up. But I mean, that's that's the hopeless way to look at it, right? right. Like it, it kind of. But that's part of the critique, I think, that it's it sort of gives into the fact that you need these kind of things in Hollywood to get movies made, right? Uh, yes. Or, or you know, as, as the movie, as adaptation sees it, right? Yeah. Um, and then we get the stakeout, and then we're chasing, tailing their car from the airport, and, like, we're just, do, we're just doing the three. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by the end of this movie, this movie becomes the three. And what's actually interesting, uh, I don't know if you stuck through the end credits, Mike. I did uh, not. But at the very end of the credits, uh, a quote comes on the screen, and it's a quote from Donald's movie, The Three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from a character called Cassie. Uh, and the quote goes this. Uh, We're all one thing, Lieutenant. That's what I've come to realize. Like cells in a body. Except we can't see the body the way fish can't see the ocean. And so we envy each other, hurt each other, hate each other. How silly is that? A heart cell hating a lung cell. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, kind of profound. Kind of, I mean, I think it's interesting. There's like a fan theory that uh, the three... Uh, actually symbolizes uh, Charlie, Donald, and Susan. Like, they are technically the three, like, all kind of different shades of the same person. Right, oh, yeah. Uh, and specifically Charlie and Donald, but uh, Susan is also part of that as well. Uh, and so that that quote kind of uh, is what people point to when they uh, say that, because, you know, it's just saying we're all one thing, uh, like cells in the body, so we envy each other and we hurt each other and we hate each other uh, and all that stuff. And then af after that quote leaves the screen, it also says, in loving memory of Donald Kaufman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I, I mean i definitely think that that's a um you know a, definitely a metaphor th throughout the whole film right like <laughs> that charlie wants to do susan like a, i mean he wants to do susan but <laughs> 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 yeah which becomes a plot point right but he wants to do her story justice uh to the point where he becomes obsessed about um that la that's the final line of the book, and I can't remember it right now. Oh, man. 
like you know it's something that you 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 desire and obsess after but ultimately it's unobtainable right right which it's the then i don't know i don't know where i'm going with that but it's just something that i think that i would believe that that fan theory you know that they're all uh part of the same person or same psyche at least yeah uh so that's definitely something and i, I do want to uh, point out like this like just about because uh, Char- charlie doesn't add himself to the screenplay until about like an hour into the movie like you, you watch him kind of like <laughs> agonizing about how he's ad- adapting this whole thing and like how he's making this movie. Uh, and then that moment of realization when he realizes what he's done and added himself to the screenplay, when Donald comes in and like asks him how it's going and he's just like, yeah, that, I think that's just such a good scene where cage is just like, like not even like processing what he just did. Like he's still trying to figure out like how he just wrote what he just wrote. And <laughs> right. And he's just like, there's this moment of silence and he's just like, I've written myself into my own screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> like this quiet thing and Donald's like well that's a little weird isn't it <laughs> I'm insane I'm Earl Bruce I don't know what that word means I've written myself into my screenplay that's kind of weird huh it's self-indulgent it's narcissistic it's solipsistic it's pathetic I'm pathetic I'm fat and pathetic I'm sure you had good reasons Charles you're an artist the reason is because I'm too timid to speak to the woman who wrote the book because I'm pathetic because I have no idea how to write. Because I can't make flowers fascinating. Because I suck. But he's and he's just like so involved in this new concept now that it's like the one thing he can uh, stand behind. And I think that's really uh, interesting. Uh, and then the, towards the, the end of the movie, I mean, uh, Charlie at the end, like after Donald has died, uh, he's driving away and he's describing the scene as he's driving away as the voiceover at the end of the movie. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, and he's talking about how the script is over. He's finally finished. Uh, and he just says, like, it's done. And that's something. Like, that's, <laughs> that's, yep. that's like it. That's how I felt after I've, after I've written everything in my entire life was like, it's finally done. <laughs> I don't have to yeah. worry about it anymore. Uh, it's I, the, the, the gift, you know, the Frodo on Mount Doom. It's, it's done. It's over. Yes. It's finally done. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then they make a joke like, uh, I wonder who should play me in the movie. I, th- I like Gerard Depardieu. I think he's a good. <laughs> <laughs> he would be good. Uh, but yeah, uh, any other scenes you want to talk about, Mike? Uh, the scene where Cage asks Judy Greer out is uh, is brutal. Is <laughs> it's pretty? I, I have to, you know, it's it's so you have to give Cage credit. I think it's it's such a interesting or I don't I don't want to say bold maybe right like in Hollywood where where perception is so important. Like you know you you know we get we've had leading hunk cage for a couple movies recently in this yeah. podcast and then to go to this character like to break that type so hard yeah <laughs> into charlie kaufman <laughs> where he kind of can't even finish the sentence of asking someone out right, right. yeah but like, <laughs> I, mean, I mean part of, yeah i agree with that like he's it's so like difficult for him to get it out and it's so like like you know it's not going to work as soon as he starts talking and like <laughs> yeah because he'd only met her once before and then fantasized about her uh yeah and you know they have like uh, like just the way Judy Greer is playing it, like you can tell she's just a waitress, she, like trying to be like friendly and polite to the customer. And they talk yep. about like orchids for a bit, and Cage uh, starts to ask her out to the uh, the orchid fair or whatever it is. <laughs> and uh, you know the the way her face just falls as soon as he starts talking, <laughs> and as, yeah. soon, as soon as she realizes what he's about to say, he's like, and the way Cage realizes that her face falls and it just, it just kind of trails off and just leaves. Like <laughs> it's oh man, oh, man, it's it's tough to watch. <laughs> It is. It's real tough. I mean, that, then that happens a couple times, right? When, um, oh man, like the first sort of girlfriend whose name I just oh, who, uh, I blanked out. Amelia, yeah, right. When she's in the car after they went to that violin show, apparently, like the concert. Right. Uh, yeah, she. And she's like, kind of like, what are you doing? You are, like sort of asking him to come upstairs, and he just can't like do it. Yeah. <laughs> this is bad. It's tough to watch, man. It's, yeah. It's just, it is a rough watch, uh, and uh, yeah. Other, otherwise. Uh, I do want to say that that screenwriting seminar, uh, Brian Cox's whole like monologue when Charlie Kaufman asks a question, uh, mm-hmm. I think is amazing. Like the <laughs> Brian yeah. Cox's whole thing, uh, where Charlie asks him like, uh, you know, what if you want to make a movie that doesn't have a typical Hollywood structure? How you want it to be like, you know, nobody really changes or learns anything. You know, it's more of a reflection of life. And then McKee makes this huge passionate speech about how there are stories everywhere in life. You have to look for them, and if you can't find that stuff in life, then you don't know crap about life. Like that's a really uh, different way of looking at it. I feel like so many movies, I think there are a lot of movies that kind of say like, oh, it reflects life and like it's, you know, they're formless like, and there are right. a lot of good ones like that. But, uh, you know, I feel like this is a very like Hollywood way of looking at life almost and like trying to figure out exactly 
what that person's story is and where they go from wherever they're coming from is uh, something that Robert McKee does in uh, his screenwriting class and something that Charlie Kaufman kind of takes away from it. It's like a profound thing for him as a character. Sure. What if a writer is attempting to create a story where nothing much happens, where people don't change, they don't have any epiphanies, they struggle and are frustrated and nothing is resolved? More a reflection of the real world. The real world? Yes, sir. The real fucking world. First of all, you write a screenplay without conflict or crisis, you'll bore your audience to tears. Secondly, nothing happens in the world? Are you out of your fucking mind? People are murdered every day. There's genocide, war, corruption. Every fucking day, somewhere in the world, somebody sacrifices his life to save somebody else. Every fucking day, someone somewhere takes a conscious decision to destroy someone else. People find love. People lose it. For Christ's sake, a child watches a mother beaten to death on the steps of a church. Someone goes hungry. Somebody else betrays his best friend for a woman. If you can't find that stuff in life, then you, my friend, don't know crap about life. And why the fuck are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? I don't have any use for it. I don't have any bloody use for it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, he definitely, he, you know, he says that... Uh... It didn't even it, it didn't call into question the way I write it. It calls into how I am a human, right? I think or something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's kind of funny because that felt like such a like melodramatic, like pretentious screenwriting coach answer, oh, right? Hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> but it, it like it, but it's at the same time really profound in some way. In some yeah. way. And that's part that's part of the movie too. There's this kind of like. Right this balance being struck between like artificiality uh, and something that's like close to something being real, like real versus artificial, uh, right. like the commercialism versus the uh, artistic integrity of the artist and all that stuff. Uh, and this, it's kind of about finding the balance between those things to make your way in Hollywood. Uh, and also somehow being true to yourself and making this kind of stuff. And like adaptation on its own is like a really insane artistic work. Like that's like, right. <laughs> uh, and it's like incredible. That movie got made within a Hollywood system. And so, uh, that by itself is kind of a miracle. And the fact that this movie exists and the movie exists within the world of the movie is also <laughs> kind of insane. <laughs> yeah. I, I did love that moment. Just, uh, uh, one last scene, I guess, or just, you know, uh, you know, when, when the movie starts becoming about the, the movie like or when it's when you start to realize that it is literally the movie right uh when uh charlie kaufman is struggling to figure out how to start and he's he's you know have he gets the the breakthrough of what are flowers and flowers adapted out of all the stuff and he starts talking into his voice recorder about we start at the beginning of time and it's yes. there's nothing there which is uh, just how the movie started yeah <laughs> yeah it starts it starts off like 40 billion years ago and it shows like the entire montage of evolution and dinosaurs like getting killed off by the asteroid and all that stuff yeah <laughs> yeah it it's was, wonderful it was really, it's just yeah. a crazy joke yes it was uh, pretty insane yeah so is there anything else about adaptation you wanted to uh throw out there mike before we move on uh i think that this is just a a wild movie like you said i can't believe this exists uh and is so good i can right like, <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy it, it, it uh definitely offers up a lot to think about so definitely check it out if you haven't yeah absolutely i'm a big fan of adaptation finally i'm glad i got finally got to watch it again uh and uh yeah so let's move on to some netflix reviews mike for adaptation uh so there are a lot of negative reviews of adaptation on uh <laughs> On Netflix. Uh, Plebeians. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, this was a, a pretty critically acclaimed movie, but it's also something that I feel like if you're not uh, in touch with what it's going for, then you are not going to like it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is kind of uh, how I took away from it, as, at least from these Netflix reviews. Uh, here's a one-star review of Adaptation. Adaptation was incredibly tedious. It was a trip inside the mind of a neurotic man, not to be confused with the mind of an artistic man. Uh, I did not finish the movie because the first 20 minutes were too mind-numbing. I cut my losses. Unless you enjoy hanging out with neurotic people, choose another movie. Which, I Savage, mean, I guess. I guess. <laughs> I find it so weird. That these like So many of these reviews, like in a lot of the movies that we reviewed, are people who are like, I, I turned off for 20 minutes. It was bad. 
<laughs> like you didn't, you didn't even give it a chance, man. Yeah. Uh, here's a four star review of uh, adaptation, which is actually a warning to people who might not like adaptation. If you if you aren't into Nicolas Cage, slow pacing, unconventional scripts, or anything that might be described as artsy, steer clear. If you're looking for a straight retelling of the actual book, The Orchid Thief, definitely steer clear. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the- <laughs> that's it. That's the whole review. Oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I do like to think there are like hardcore Orchid Thief fans that were super upset with this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just wasn't really true to the book, you know? <laughs> I just wanted a movie about flowers. Why did they make that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a one-star review of Adaptation. I can't believe people actually like this kind of stuff. If you like movies that are quote-unquote mental, I guess you'd like this. I sure didn't. It was very slow and boring, depressing. I did like there are real genuine feelings going on, and I do like it when shows portray people's real thoughts. I liked that there was some mention of plants and orchids. <laughs> However, <laughs> I just found it overall dark, boring, depressing, overglorified, and I'll add the movie seemed to make it just fine. This married woman is attracted to this man and keeps pursuing him. Uh, <laughs> I love that it kind of starts out about its merits, right? Like <laughs> it is dark, it is depressing, it is kind of boring in some fashion, right? Yeah. But then also morality slam at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. They like they they like they mentioned plants and orchids though. Eh, that's always nice. <laughs> At least it's sort of about what it's about. <laughs> uh, here's a one star review of adaptation. It got some good reviews, but I personally think it was a load of overblown middle class twaddle. <laughs> twaddle. Uh, whoever wrote it was clearly thinking too hard and trying to be clever, but didn't pull it off. I mean, not, that's what not you as clever, think. Not as clever as the word twaddle. I'll give you that. <laughs> True. It's a pretty high bar to hit, Mike. Uh, here's another one-star review of Adaptation. Here we go. The book The Orchid Thief was excellent. You should read it. <laughs> yeah. This movie about not being able to make a movie about the book is direct, and it's a shame the two are even associated. So. Wait, did he say – did they say direct or is a wreck? Oh, is Drek. Oh, okay. All right. Drek. Drek. Got it. Like uh, like Chairman Drek from Ratchet and Clank. <laughs> That's definitely the reference they were making. <laughs> uh, here's a two-star review of Adaptation. Points off as Hollywood found a means of cannibalizing itself. <laughs> which is not wrong. The plot, yeah. the plot, which makes direct link to being John Malkovich, bludgeoning the lowbrows who didn't get it in the opening scenes, is dull, and not because I viewed this film at midnight, but because it doesn't generate interest. It's a dull meeting where a screenwriter is being interviewed for a job. Likewise, a novelist is being coaxed and cajoled to sell the rights for film adaptation, hence the title. I wonder now if the Oscars were awarded as condolence prizes for wasting such stellar talent on this vehicle. <laughs> uh, the film veers off the rails in its desperation to reach a climactic ending by having two individuals who'd rather fade into the swamps of oblivion rise from the primordial ooze and become aggressive, far outside their comfort zone that has been established from the outset of the film. As some reviewers note, it grabs a typical Hollywood ending and kills the immoral individuals, leaving us to wonder which twin really died and which was reborn. <laughs> <laughs> the quote, the quote unquote insider joke will appeal to those who need to laugh at their business of show, but will fall flat on someone looking for a fun night away from fasting and Lent. <laughs> The, the topic could have been placed in a different context, but the writer chose the easy way by putting off research and study of other lives, communities, and a focus on the limited scope of their own vocation. I'm tempted to say swing and a miss, but... <laughs> <laughs> A lot of harsh words there. A lot yeah. of harsh words there. I do, I'll, it did remind me of a couple of things that I did want to say that I liked about this movie there. The uh, connections to being John Malkovich, which we, did, which we didn't really touch upon. Right, um, that's true. But uh, a lot of the opening of this movie takes place on the set of being John Malkovich, and we mentioned that there were cameos and stuff. Uh, but I think what's really cool is that uh, it, because, it's, because it's being John Malkovich that that movie's – like it's not just any movie you know, that yeah. we're working on. It's being John Malkovich, and being John Malkovich is a great movie. Um, but it's also a really like visually unique movie. Uh, and so the set of that movie is also a visually unique thing to see in this movie. Um, yeah. Because you have, like, the first – one of the first things you see in this movie is John Malkovich on the set uh, during the Malkovich-Malkovich scene where there are 50 other extras all dressed as John Malkovich. 
Uh, and so, like, in the background of, like, the next scene, you see, like, people in the background, like, walking behind that are all, like, Malkovich in different, like, outfits. Yeah. <laughs> I like had that. wondered originally if that footage was, like, real, behind, like, between take footage. <clears throat> yeah. uh, until Nick Cage is, like, in front, is standing there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and it definitely uses that the most unique set, I think, or one of the most unique sets in uh, Being John Malkovich, the tiny hallway. Yes. <laughs> yeah, use the tiny hallway, and you see John Cuse, that kind of, like, Say like waving at Charlie and saying hi, and then like just turning around and walking underneath the tr- the tiny hallway. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's great. So that's cool. It, it uses like familiar imagery to create something new because you're seeing it from the perspective of somebody who has seen the imagery already. Like it's part se- like it's part of a set instead of part of a movie, which is a right. a different way to view it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I also did want to mention uh, I, I had forgotten about this before. Chris Cooper gets one of my biggest laughs in the movie uh, towards the end, where uh, Cage shows up at Susan Orlean and Chris Cooper's house. Uh, and they're having sex, and uh, Chris Cooper is completely naked, and he like, <laughs> sees uh, Ch- uh, Nicholas Cage. I think it's Charlie Kaufman who is uh, yeah, it's Charlie, there. yeah. Uh, and like, like uh, he's run like Streep sees him, and they're like Streep is freaking out, and Cooper's like uh, just kind of like confused, and he's like <laughs> and he's just kind of wandering around, and he sees Charlie, and uh, Streep like looks at him, and is like, wait, you're you're the screenwriter guy, you're the guy who's adapting my book into the movie. And uh, Chris Cooper, who, again, is still completely naked, uh, is just yeah. like, oh, really, man? That's wild. Good to meet you. And he, like, <laughs> starts to shake his hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was that scene was great. Yeah. I love that. So I, I did want to mention that because that was a very funny uh, bit. Uh, anyway, so that, that's a, a little bit of a tangent. I do have one last review here. All right. Lay it on us, Mike. Three-star reviews of Adaptation. Uh, at first, I thought this movie is weird, but I kept watching and began to enjoy it. Chris Cooper was great. He definitely earned his Academy Award. I learned a lot about orchids. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least that's something. Yeah. Though. So there you have it, folks. <laughs> Watch Adaptation. Uh, you might learn something about the human condition, and you might learn a little something about orchids. <laughs> yeah. What more could you ask for from exactly. a movie? Uh, so, Mike, you're a fan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, I am also a fan of adaptation. Mike, where can we find you online this week? You can find me at twitter.com slash mdfilmblog. And if you like Dungeons and Dragons, my friends and I post our games at youtube.com slash geonerd79. And you can find me online at twitter.com slash msmithfilmblog and all of our podcasts and stuff at filmbook.com. Plus, you can find my work at crookedscoreboard.com as well. Thank you for listening to The Complete Works. I'm Mike Smith. That is Mike DiCrescio. If you're listening to this review via our podcast and iTunes, you can subscribe to our podcast, rate it, and take a moment to give us a review and help support this podcast and filmbook by taking part in our Patreon campaign. You can find our Patreon campaign page at patreon.com slash filmbook any and all feedback compliments topic discussions and even hate mail can be sent directly to podcast at filmbook.com please list the podcast you are emailing about in the title of your email because we produce just so many different ones it's hard to keep track we would love to hear from you now join us in two weeks for another episode of the complete works in which we'll be talking about the only film that Nicolas cage has ever directed so far so far let's say you know, we're yeah. not, we're not going to say it will be the only movie he ever directs. You never know. He could come back and direct, I don't know, uh, Thor, Thor 4 or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it could happen. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas True. Cage stars in and directs Thor 4. Who do you think Nicholas Cage would play in a theoretical Thor movie? Wow. Uh, that's tough. I don't know. <laughs> Heim, Heimdall. No. <laughs> The new Heimdall. <laughs> yes. I'm into, I'm into it, actually. I could see that working out very well. Uh, and then you can join us for the next episode of Film Bookcast. We'll be talking about uh, a Marvel movie, not Thor 4. Uh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which is coming out this week. And uh, I'm hearing good things. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely pumped. Yeah, so that'll be, a, that'll be cool. That'll be a fun review. So thank you guys so much for listening. And thanks for getting in the cage. I'm